I believe we've taken care of the backlog at the door, so good evening, everyone. I'm Marty Krieger, chairperson of the Sauk County Board, and on behalf of the Planning and Zoning Department of Sauk County, the Sauk County Comprehensive Plan Steering Committee, and last but not least, the Sauk County Board of Supervisors, I'd like to welcome you to Facing Our Future a community conversation for the future of Sauk County. This event is one of the many opportunities for public participation throughout the Sauk County comprehensive planning process. In April of last year, the Sauk County Board appointed 23 of your neighbors and friends and charged them with, with being members of this committee. They were charged with developing a plan that will guide Saw County into the next decade. To date, the committee conducted an assessment of the current state of the county. The assessment included a summary of the key statistics, demographics, and existing local plans. Then, utilizing public input, they identified the 17 priority issues listed on your agenda in the packets that you received at the door. Tonight, we need your help to develop a vision for what Sauk County could look like in the next 20 years and how we might achieve these common goals. This evening is a critical point in the planning process and your input, each one of you, is vital to the success of the plan and to the future of our county. I not only want to thank you for your attendance this evening, but also encourage your participation in the breakout sessions that follow our keynote address. I would also at this time like to recognize the members of the Sauk County Comprehensive Plan Steering Committee for their hard work and dedication to this process. They, are, they serve an invisible part almost of this process, but at this time, if those individuals who are present could stand up and be recognized, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> On behalf of the board and the citizens of the county, thank you for your efforts and your time. Now I'd like to give you a quick overview of how the evening will work. We will kick things off with our keynote speaker, Richard Longworth. I think Richard will challenge us to look at the Midwest from a diff different perspective and perhaps give us a few ideas on where we might go from here. We have asked Richard to leave 15 minutes for questions following his presentation. Please write your questions on the note cards included in your folder. You all should have index cards in your folder. Someone will collect them throughout the presentation. Following Richard's presentation, we will have a short break out in the atrium that will be followed by two breakout sessions. These breakout sessions will be facilitated discussions designed to develop strategies or actions for each of the topics that you find on your agenda. After this evening, we sincerely hope you will continue to participate throughout the planning process by logging on to our website, www.socplan.org. There, there you will find discussion forums and a blog designed to help you keep, to keep you involved in the planning process. At this time, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker. Richard Longworth is a senior fellow at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs and distinguished visiting scholar at DePaul University. He is the author of the book, Caught in the Middle, America's Heartland in the Age of Globalization, which describes the impact of globalization on our Midwest. Richard joined the council in 2003 as executive director of the Global Chicago Center after a career in journalism, most recently as senior correspondent for the Chicago Tribune. For 20 years, is for 20 years in a, as a correspondent for the Tribune and the United Press International, he was the Tribune's chief European correspondent. 
We are very fortunate to have him with us tonight. Please help me give Richard Longworth a warm Sauk County welcome. Marty, thanks so much. That was a warm Salt County welcome. I'm very glad to be here. It's a pleasure, really, to be here tonight to talk about what's going on in the Midwest, how our economy and our lives are being transformed every day, and what this means to Midwesterners and their communities, to Salt County, and to the people who live here. I really admire what you're trying to do here tonight, to create this vision for the future, to get together to talk about what your future should be, and I'm honored to be asked to be a part of it. Since I wrote my book, since it came out about a year ago, I've been traveling a lot around the Midwest and talking with people who are living with this global transformation. Basically, what I'm finding out is they know their lives are changing, are being changed, not always for the better, and they want to know why and what they can do about it. That's what my book is about, and it's what I would like to discuss tonight. Now, you all know a whole lot better than I do what's going on right here in Salt County and in your region of Wisconsin. But what I want to do is to put this local impact into a global and a regional context, to talk about how globalization is literally transforming the entire Midwest, and how we can develop some sort of vision some sort of vision for the Midwest and some sort of vision for Salt County on how we can use this transformation to grow and to thrive. Now part of this is about economics. Globalization at base is an economic force, but it's about so much more than economics. The shape of our economy and our economic vitality determine everything else. Not only how we work, but how we live, how we think, how we view ourselves, and how we see ourselves within the, broad, the wider world. The industrial age, the last big economic wave, the industrial age literally created our Midwest, our industries, but also our towns and our cities, towns like Reedsburg and Baraboo and Sauk County, and it created our culture. We're more than just a labor pool, we're a civilization. Now globalization is turning all this inside out. This future is new, it's just arrived. And we're still figuring out how to deal with it, how to shape it. My book dealt with the effect of globalization on all the Midwest, from big cities like Chicago and Detroit, to smaller factory towns, to the farm towns and rural areas that give this region so much of its character. A lot of it, I'm afraid, is a little grim. If Chicago is booming, most other major cities like Detroit or Cleveland or St. Louis are lagging far behind. Many of the old factory towns existed to serve a company or an industry that has left town. Places like Dayton in Ohio or Newton in Iowa or Janesville, not so far from here. Some of these places might not survive as the towns they once were. A lot of the Midwest's little farm towns might not survive either, literally, this time. These towns were founded to serve the farm families in the region, and as farms consolidate, the number of those families declined by the year, leaving some of these little towns with no real reason for existence. Now, as I said, a lot of this wasn't very cheerful. Basically, my point was that the Midwest, all the Midwest, from Ohio through Iowa, from Minnesota through Michigan, does two big things for a living which are intensive farming and heavy industry and globalization has come along and tossed both of them right up in the air. We're not coping with this very well right now. Not our leaders, nor our governments, nor our schools and universities. Once upon a time, about a century ago, hard to imagine now, but it's true. About a century ago, we were the Silicon Valley of the United States, the wellspring of all the good ideas and innovations that made America tick. Many of these ideas and innovations were so good so powerful, created so many big corporations and jobs that they sustained us for generations, with the upshot being that we didn't have to have any more good ideas. And somewhere along the way, we lost this knack of innovation. We learned to make do with what we had. Today, too often, much of the Midwest looks like a backwater, having trouble keeping both our jobs and our best young people. I suggested in my book that it's time for the Midwest to face facts, 
to stop denying reality and to work together as a region to find a future in this new globalizing world. Well, since the book came out, a couple of interesting things have happened. First, we've elected a Midwesterner as president, and he's given good jobs in government to a lot of other Midwesterners. So for the first time in years, when the Midwest phones Washington, somebody there is going to answer the phone. <laughs> Second, as you all know only too well, we're in a global economic downturn, the worst financial crisis in 80 years or so. Now, this isn't fun for anybody. But here in the Midwest, this crisis is probably going to finish off much of what's left of the old Midwestern economy. But crises and catastrophes do concentrate the mind. Denial is no longer an option. When you hit bottom, you have two choices. Either turn out the lights or reinvent yourself into something new, something innovative and creative. Even before this crisis hit, a lot of Midwesterners were thinking hard about the new challenges, including global challenges, and how to meet them. I think that what's going on now just might be the jolt, the good swift kick that we really needed to reinvent ourselves, to reinvent this Midwest, possibly with a little help from our old neighbors now resident in Washington. Now I'll come back to all this later, <clears throat> but let me talk a bit about the problems we face. Most of them existed before the current crisis, and if we don't do something about them, they're going to be here after this crisis ends. These are the problems posed by globalization and our regional failure to cope with it. Now, I want to say right away that you're not going to get any anti-globalization tirade from me tonight. Globalization is here, and it's not going to go away. We can't raise the drawbridge. We can't stop the world and get off, even if some days we'd like to. Globalization is the present, and it's the future. And saying it's bad or good is like saying that that last big economic wave, the industrial age, was bad or good. Well, it was good, bad for some people, and it was good for other people, and once we got the hang of it, it was really good for the Midwest. We pretty much invented the industrial age, and it made us rich. That era created Midwestern industry, and Midwestern farming, and Midwestern cities, Midwestern railroads, and Midwestern education. Through all its ups and downs, we became the economic heart of the nation, indeed, the economic heart of the world. For all its raw power and labor battle and pollution, the industrial age was very, very good for the Midwest. And now it's over. The age of globalization is here. And if you think the industrial age changed the way we live, you haven't seen anything yet. What I'm saying is the thing that we got good at, which is running heavy industry and a relatively protected national market has gone away. Wisconsin knows this, I think, but it's more than just a local problem or a state problem. It's a Midwestern problem, a regional problem. We have new challenges from places and people that we never had to pay attention to before, and all my research shows we aren't doing a very good job of it. Now, if you want a definition of globalization, go Google on globalization. You'll get hundreds of different definitions. But basically, I think for our purpose, <clears throat> globalization means that we're in a global competition, not just with the South or California anymore, even with Europe or Japan, but with the entire world, with factory workers in China and office workers in India, and yes, with farmers in Brazil. I want to stress that all of this is really new. Much of the Midwestern industry has been declining for years through uh, the Rust Belt era. Farm consolidation has been growing for years. Well, what's going on now, this process of globalization, is very, very new. China, Russia, and the other former communist countries have joined our economy in the past 20 years or so. India has been a major player for maybe a decade. All the technology that makes this possible the internet, the web, and Netscape, and communication satellites, and fiber optics. Almost all of this is younger than today's college freshmen. Something like three billion new workers have joined our economy in the past two, past two decades, and they compete with us every hour and every day. Now, since most of these people came from relatively poor countries, they didn't bring a whole lot of new money with them, which means we have about three times as many workers competing for roughly the same amount of money. So no wonder the squeeze is on wages and costs and doing things as cheaply, as efficiently as possible. So what does this mean then for the Midwest? I'll try and summarize some of the effects that I found before getting on to what we can do about it. 
First, I found that my view from Chicago was really deceptive. Chicago is almost unique in having made the transition from industrial behemoth to global city. Chicago still has its problems, as we all know, but its vitality and its prosperity are the envy of most other Midwestern cities. Some other cities, like Minneapolis, which had less of an industrial legacy to overcome, are also doing pretty well. So are a few other smaller cities like Grand Rapids in Michigan, some university towns, like that one just south of here, and a handful of small manufacturing towns and some big global corporations like Cargo. But these are the exceptions. Let's talk about the overall pattern. First, big cities. If Chicago is doing well, most of the other big Midwestern cities give every sign of dying out. Places like Detroit and Cleveland and St. Louis, they're strange places, empty, almost echoing. They're each is less than half as big as it used to be that has the highest poverty rates and the highest dropout rates in the nation. In the state of Ohio, six of the seven biggest cities in Ohio, all except Columbus, six of the seven biggest cities have each lost more than half their population and three quarters of their industrial jobs. Most of these uh, cities have huge impoverished inner city populations. In Milwaukee, for instance, the Journal Sentinel reported that the unemployment rate for African American males in Milwaukee is no less than 70, 70 percent, and that's distress any way you cut it. Nor are many of these cities drawing immigrants. St. Louis and Cleveland once were more than 50 percent foreign born, now they're only 5 percent and getting less. Chicago, by comparison, is about 23 percent. As one guy in Cleveland told me, he says, we can't even get illegal immigrants to come here. <laughs> now, most of these cities <clears throat> are surrounded by reasonably prosperous suburbs, but they're holes in the donut. Cities are the focus of globalization, where globalization happens. And if global cities are the places where creative and innovative people come together to invent the future, then some of these cities may have no future. The same is true of smaller industrial cities and towns. The industrial age scattered these smaller factory towns across the Midwestern landscape. These are places like Dayton or Janesville or Flint or Kokomo or Muncie, all of them anchors of an economy that is going away. All have lost many of the industries, the factories and the companies that supported them for a century. Now these cities must reinvent themselves to thrive in the global era. Those that don't won't disappear necessarily. The earth isn't going to open up and swallow them, but there'll be backwaters, shrinking cities, shut out of the global conversation. Dayton, Ohio, for instance. Dayton has a pretty good claim to have invented the 20th century. Dayton has more patents per capita than any other American city. I mean, they had the Wright brothers, of course, invented their airplane there, but Dayton also invented the microfiche and the parking meter and the stepladder and the pop-top can. Especially, Dayton produced Charles Kettering, who invented the auto uh, ignition, and with that founded the Dayton Electronics Laboratories Company, or Delco for short, which later became Delphi. As you probably know, Delphi's American branch declared bankruptcy to get rid of its American workers. In Dayton, this gets personal. <clears throat> Delphi used to have five plants in the Dayton region employing more than 30,000 workers. Now four of those five plants are closed or closing, and pretty quick, there's, Delphi will have a few hundred workers there at most. Dayton is struggling to find a new way to earn its living, but it isn't quite there yet. Newton, Iowa is another example, a town founded by Maytag for Maytag. Now Whirlpool has bought Maytag, and the company left town a year ago, both its headquarters, which went to Michigan, and its factory, which went to Mexico. Newton, too, is looking for a new paycheck. The same can be said of Muncie, Indiana, which was once such a typical American small town that the sociologists called it Middletown. Muncie was the home of the ball company, ball glass, ball jars. Both the ball glass, ball company and the ball family are gone now, and the biggest private employer in town, as in so many of these towns, is Walmart. Midwestern manufacturing has been declining, of course, has been declining for years. But many places fought back and bought themselves another 20 years or so. They hung on to some of their old industry and persuaded themselves that what was going on was just part of the ordinary economic ups and downs, not really a sea change. Instead of seeking new 21st century jobs, they tried to keep the old jobs, 
that in truth can be done almost as well and a whole lot cheaper somewhere else. <clears throat> now globalization has come along and finished the job. As one economist in Indiana told me, he said, we rode that horse too long. The same is true of farming. Farms are beginning bigger and the rural population smaller for decades, but globalization is speeding up the process by putting farmers too into global competition and forcing them to be ever bigger, ever more efficient, ever more tied to the giant corporations like Cargill and ADM, which dominate the food industry. Not that, not that the corporations own the farms, they don't. But they operate through mega farmers, farmers with huge operations of land and livestock. I talked with Iowa farmers who farm 10,000, even 20,000 acres. I visited a dairy farm in northern Indiana that has 29,000 cows and a whole lot of mechanized milking. Now, obviously, this isn't anybody's idea of typical, traditional Midwestern family farm. Neither are the small rural towns. As I mentioned, these towns were founded about 150 years ago, most of them, to serve the farm families in the region, to be a place where the farmers could, go, could shop or go to church or have a drink or see their doctor or send their kids to school. This worked when each farm was on the average about 160 acres. Now, in much of the Midwest, the average farm is 10 times that big or bigger, which means 10 times fewer farmers, which means 10 times fewer customers for those small town shops, 10 times fewer worshipers at the church, 10 times fewer patients for the town doctor, 10 times fewer students in the school. These towns, many of them, have lost their bank, <coughs> they've lost their railroad, they even lost their grocery stores. This is too typical of so many of these small rural towns, the ones too far from cities to be bedroom suburbs. Their best young people leave, and those left behind tend to be the poorer, the less educated. Even technology is against them. Rural residents have about half the high-speed internet access as city people, and in this day and age, if you're not online, you're out of luck. Across the Midwest, some of the places that are growing and thriving these days, though, are doing it by drawing in immigrants. Now, we're used to this in Chicago. All those PhDs from India and all those workers from Mexico have literally saved our city. But in the countryside, beyond the metro areas, this immigration is concentrating in a few farming towns or towns with meatpacking plants. These are places like Beardstown in Illinois or Worthington, Minnesota, or, of course, Postville in Iowa which has become the poster child for immigration mismanaged on all sides. Most of these are conservative old blue collar towns. <clears throat> Almost overnight, they've gone from being mostly white to about 40% Mexican, with the Mexicans taking meatpacking jobs that used to be held by the whites. Now this sounds like a recipe for real trouble, but I was so impressed going around to these towns by the determination and the seriousness with which these towns uh, are trying to absorb the newcomers and deal with the problems they cause. But for all their efforts, these small-town Americans are terribly con conflicted about all this. Most of the new Mexicans are illegal or undocumented, if you will. These towns see neighboring towns dying away, and they know that their future depends on these immigrants who have to break the law to get there, which is to say the town has to break the law to survive. It's a very, very complex human situ uh, situation. And these good people are not helped by the posturing and demagoguery of politicians and pundits who score points in election years by beating the immigration drum. Iowa, like all Midwestern states, desperately needs immigrants. But the Iowa legislature passed a law making English the state's official language. Now, clearly, this law has no practical application. But it does send a message that Iowa doesn't want the very people who just may be of their future. Education is another area where the states and state governments are failing their people, and in the global era, it's hard to think of anything more important than education. We're in the knowledge economy now. The 21st century Midwest needs workers who know science and math, who know the world and how it works, who are capable of the kind of globalized innovation and creativity that will power this new economy. Now, everybody knows that high school students, most places, are not getting this kind of education. This is a national problem, not just a Midwestern one. But the Midwest has one huge asset. It's the galaxy of great universities, especially the big research universities in places like Ann Arbor or Madison. 
These schools are literally the 21st century meal ticket for the Midwestern states. The news is that where state universities are concerned, the states themselves are throwing away this asset. State funding for the universities that bear their name is shrinking to almost nothing. The state of Michigan pays only 7% of the operating expenses for the university in Ann Arbor. Other big universities get more, but not that much more. The former president of the University of Michigan told me that his school has gone from being a state-supported university to a state-located university to a state-harassed university. <laughs> Everywhere, universities are looking to alumni or higher tuitions or especially to contracts with corporations to pay the rent. Now, there are reasons for this, and we've touched on many, some of them already. A region that always depended on good jobs on the assembly line often just doesn't see the point in college. They took a poll in Michigan of parents in Michigan that showed that 65% of that state's parents did not see higher education as crucial to their child's future well-being. Not that they were hostile to it. A kid could go to college if he wanted to. Just, they just didn't see the need. This attitude translates quickly into political support or more but rather lack of political support. All Midwestern states these days pay more to take care of their prisoners than they do to educate their children. And this zeroes in on a crucial point, which is the Midwestern system is based on individual states and that system is simply incompetent to cope with something as big and complicated as globalization. I was astonished going around the Midwest and talking with people who were real experts on their own state, with economists and academics and politicians and business leaders, to find that people who knew everything there was to know about their own state had literally no idea what was going on next door across the state line. In the Midwest, in the Midwest intellectual life is dominated by those big state universities. Political life is dominated by the state governments. But globalization couldn't care less about state lines drawn more than two centuries ago. All over the world, regions and countries with much in common are coming together to cope with globalization. The Midwestern states have everything in common, everything we've been talking about tonight. But they're trying to fight this battle on their own, and they are simply too small, too outdated, too parochial to do the job. Now, it's easy to blame incumbents for this. <clears throat> but the fact is that all Midwestern state governments are so saddled with the legacy costs of the industrial era the need to pay for unemployed workers in dying towns and declining rural areas, that they don't have the time or the money or the focus to deal with the real needs of the future, like education. Now, state governments aren't going to go away. The federal system is not about to be repealed, but nor is globalization. State governments have to be part of the conversation. But let's face it, they're not going to take the lead, nor should they. Instead, the place to start is to begin thinking regionally. We need to start thinking across state boundaries, across county boundaries, across the traditional political boundaries. We have to start looking at this Midwest as a region with real global assets instead of as a clutch of state-based fiefdoms. Wisconsin has its problems, but they're basically the same problems that beset Ohio or Illinois. People in places with common interests have to come together across political lines to leverage their strengths. This means bigger regions, say like the Chicago Economic Region, which basically runs from Milwaukee through Chicago and Indiana and on up into Grand Rapids, a four-state area. This means this region acting like the single economy it really is. Those of us in that region should be working together on infrastructure, on education, on taxation, on planning, on marketing ourselves, but we don't do any of these things, and so we are so much less than the sum of our parts. Closer to home. You're working here tonight to combine the assets of all the towns in South County to leverage your strengths to compete. I hope you don't say so. I hope you don't stop there. If I may say so, all this is bigger than South County. I hope you're thinking regionally, hitching your wagon to the researchers and businesses spinning off Madison, working with other counties to market your region, even looking across the river into Iowa and Minnesota, where there are other towns and counties wrestling with exactly the same problems and exactly the same future. The only way to compete in this new global world is to band together to maximize strengths and assets so we can be more than the sum of our parts. 
This is the mandate of the future for the Midwest. All across this Midwest, cities and towns and universities and civic groups, all the players should be finding what they have in common, should be pooling their research and knowledge and skills into a true Midwestern powerhouse. Above all, we must recognize that the old days are gone, that the old industries that sustained us are going or gone, and we have to look for new ways to earn our living. We should have realized this by now, but this current economic crisis is nothing if it's not a great big wake-up call. Now, some of these new industries are out there just begging to be exploited. For instance, there's bioscience and biotechnology, the cornerstone of the biofuels and biomedical revolutions. Bio, of course, is basically plant and animal science. And if anybody knows plants and animals, it should be us here in the Midwest. But each Midwestern state is pursuing its bio future in isolation, in competition with every other state, with the result that we're already behind the two coasts. Another industry is clean water technology, the application of fresh water to new uses in farming and in chemicals and other industries. Again, we've got water, the Great Lakes the biggest freshwater research resource on this planet. And we've got an unparalleled system of rivers, some of them flowing not far from here. 20 years from now, if anyone wants to live or work or invest in a place with a reliable source of fresh water, it's going to be here in the Midwest. And it's time we got ready for it. Another is green technology, which has gone quickly from being an obsession of tree huggers to being a true industry of the future. This generally means new power. Wind, water, sun, even clean coal, and we have all this in abundance. Already, old Midwestern towns are finding new life in green technology. A few minutes ago, I talked about Newton, Iowa, where they were ready to turn out the lights when Maytag left town. Now two companies there are making plants for wind turbines, or making parts for wind turbines, and Newton is looking to the future. So should we all. President Obama's new budget will include $15 billion for clean and renewable energy, and no region is better placed to spend that money well than the Midwest. In short, old line manufacturing may be dead, but manufacturing itself has a future, so long as it's on the spear point of innovation and global creativity. If there's a silver, silver, silver lining in this economic collapse, maybe it surrounds the crumbling old auto industry. That industry is practically a paradigm for the Midwestern failure to cope with global challenges. Too much of it is an old industry with incompetent management, high cost, tired facilities, crippled by a lack of imagination and innovation, by resistance to change, all reliant on a workforce educated for the industrial age, but lacking the skills to compete globally. The fact is, we don't need an auto industry. What we need is a transit industry. Cars and trucks, fuel efficient and non-polluting, are part of this. But it's time to get serious about rapid transit, about good transit systems within regions, and especially a high-speed rail network that would truly tie this region together. Nothing says the car companies couldn't get a piece of this. If they know anything, it's how to move people and how to move goods. So let's put that knowledge to use. All of these projects, water, bio, transit, green technology, all of these make sense only if they are pursued on a regional basis. The wind blows across state lines. Great Lakes water laps at the shores of eight states, not just one. No high-speed rail network can be locked up within one state. But we're stymied by that old Midwestern orneriness, that competitiveness. All Midwestern states, it's the, it, it seems, would rather keep on rusting separately than cooperate with each other for the future. <laughs> now here's where President Obama and his stimulus plan and later spending come in. Instead of parceling out all that money to individual cities and states, wouldn't it be great if Washington told us we had to get together, to plan regionally, to come up with projects that would revive this entire region before we got the money? Actually, that's not, it's not a new idea. Washington did this once before about 60 years ago, it was called the Marshall Plan. After World War II, we told the Europeans we would help rebuild their economy. But they had to come up with the ideas, and more important, they had to do it on a regional basis to plan to revive the European, the continental economy. Well, the Europeans had just got done killing each other. But there was so much money for such a good cause that they buried the hatchet and went to work. 
It's not too much to say that the Marshall Plan, by insisting on rural, on regional cooperation, planted the seed that eventually grew into the European Union. Now, Midwesterners exist who are ready to seize this offer. As I said, I've been traveling around the Midwest talking with people and discovered that basically I only said out loud in my book what a lot of other people were already thinking. But they're doing this thinking in isolation all by themselves, not realizing that other people across the Midwest share the same problems and are looking for the same solutions. Real action still stops at the state lines, and at, in this global age, this sense of splendid isolation is a luxury we can no longer afford. My organization, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, has just taken the first step towards starting a Midwestern conversation on these issues. We've launched something called the Global Midwest Initiative, which will be partly a think tank to com uh, commission research on Midwestern policy, but mostly a forum, a table, where Midwesterners can come together <clears throat> across state lines for the first time to share experiences and war stories and try to find out what they have in common. But so much more is needed. Washington can help, but really, we have to build this future together. The fact is, that future is already here. It's a global future. Too much of the Midwest, I found, is still a mourning for the past, but we're in a new era now. The good news is that this era has just begun. The bad news is that so much of the Midwest is already behind. Thank you. Midwestern communities are independent and self-reliant. Many remain skeptical of the involvement in regional organizations that might influence local policymaking and priorities. What is the role of regional identification and alliances in improving the odds for our Midwestern communities? Um, well, as, as I mentioned, that reads that individual identity, this orneriness, this competitiveness, is put, give, uh, giving us two strikes before we even uh, get started. Um, the fact is that we are not just connected here with Madison or Minnesota or Chicago or Indiana. We're connected here with Indiana, with India and China and the rest of the world and what's going on 10,000 miles away is affecting every day. The way we live here, it's affecting our priorities, it's affecting our policies. We are being affected by this. We are all in this together. We can't, with where globalization is concerned, you can run, but you can't hide. So by insisting on a purely independent local identity, you're cutting yourself off from the real action that's going on in the rest of the world. Now, the fact is, by recognizing that there is that action out there, that there are these opportunities, that the, the world, the, the economy is changing, it is an opportunity to get on board with some of this and increase the strength of your own economy, uh, increase the vitality of your own town, your own region, your own county. Places that do this, people that get plugged into the global economy are going to be the ones that thrive. <clears throat> if I may mention something here that I think is a little touching in this region, I've been, I've been told, is the relationship with Madison. Um, you don't want Madison telling you what to do. I go around Chicago and people, you know, within 40 or 50 miles of Chicago really don't want Chicago telling them what to do. But by hooking in to these economies, a vibrant economy like Madison, a vibrant economy like Chicago, you can remain in your community. You can have your community, but it'll be a stronger community, a better community, a livelier community, a community that keeps a lot of your best people who otherwise would have to leave to find jobs. I don't know how many people commute out from here every day to the Madison region. I suspect quite a lot. But 
Um, wouldn't it be great to go to Madison and find out what's going on there, what industries they have that could be better done here, what industries they have there that need help from here? Wouldn't it be better to have industries growing up here that would feed off of Madison, but instead of having people leaving here and going to Madison to work, they'd be staying here and working, and the community would be stronger there. Towns all around the Midwest are facing this choice. A lot of old factory towns consider themselves self-sufficient for years. My hometown in Iowa considered it self-sufficient for many years. It's not anymore. It's a bedroom suburb for Ames and Des Moines, having a hard time getting used to this. But um, this, this is the, the trend here, and I don't, I don't think there's any way of getting around it. So I think the best way is to try and play off of it and use it to strengthen your own economy. Our next question is, how can we know what industries we should try to attract? You don't. Um, this is the old game of smokestack chasing and finding a factory out there and um, uh, trying to draw it into town or to figuring out that everything here is bio or everything here is um, water industry, something like that. We just did in Chicago something quite similar to what you're doing here. Uh, we call it the Global Edge. And we looked at Chicago and said, right, we've made this transition from industrial age to global city. We're a global city now. Great, you know, terrific. Now what? We are now in a global competition. And what do we have to do to really thrive in this global competition? And we made the decision early on that we weren't going to zero in on certain industries, but rather to create the conditions in which we could work. That means education. What, what do we do about those schools, especially what do we do about those t terrible Chicago city schools and how can we make them better? How do we draw more people out in from, in from outside into our universities? What do we do about the transit system? What are we doing about fiber optics? What are we doing about changing the city into a green place? What do we do about making it the kind of place where people want to come and work? In other words, the amenities, the surroundings, the, um, the nature of a town is probably going to be more important in the future. Um, I would say probably here to be sure you have the local skills, the education, the people who can do the work. Um, I would suggest, you know, going to Madison, going to Chicago, going to Milwaukee, finding out what's going on there and what is going on there that can be done better here by the people you have here. But first, you have to have the, the ambiance, the people, the structure, the infrastructure, intellectual and physical, to do the job. You just touched on this partly with your answer, but we, the next question is, we have to educate our young people for this new economy. In this changing economy, how can we prepare them for work that is likely to be here when they graduate? By giving them the skills that they will need to cope with almost any industry. When I was getting out of high school, I had a friend. He didn't know what he, he knew he didn't want to go to college, he didn't know what he wanted to do. So he did something that I thought struck me as terribly smart then. He went down to the local library and he looked up and he found out which jobs had the lowest unemployment rate in the Great Depression, the last depression. And he found the job that had the lowest unemployment rate, so Arlo went out and he became a linotype operator. <laughs> now there's some laughter here from people who know what a linotype is. For younger people, I will explain, it was a great big machine that existed in print shops, and about 10 years after Arno became, Arlo became a um, linotype operator, it was automated out of existence. He went out looking for a particular job, and then that job went away. And I think. You know, in this economy, that's likely to happen. So you educate your kids to be smart, to have science, to math, to know how to write, the ability to write a straightforward, forward, declarative English sentence is such a valuable thing, to know languages. One thing I would educate your kids on, some of them are going to stay here. I hope most of them do. But the fact is that their lives are no longer bound by the borders of Salt County, or the borders of Wisconsin, or even by the Atlantic or the Pacific Ocean. 
They belong now to a global economy. They know this every day. Every time they turn on the computer, they can figure that out. <clears throat> Their lives are going to be led out in the world, and they have to be educated to be comfortable in that world. Our next question comes uh, about agriculture. It says, agriculture is not going to go away. We will still have farms here, possibly more specialty farming for organic agriculture. What role will this play in our future economy here in the county? Um, agriculture is certainly going to continue to be a, um, play a major role in the county and in the Midwest in general. You know, climate change and all that part, uh, the land isn't going to go away and the climate isn't going to wait, go away. We're always going to raise the food. We do raise the food. Um, we are simply going to continue to raise it probably with fewer people. There are going to be some smaller farms, specialty farms, farms that service the farmer's market, uh, ones that do cheeses, specialty meats, that sort of thing, and that's terrific. That's wonderful. But that is not the wave of the future. All the statistics show that great big farms are increasing in number. Very small farms are increasing in number. The farms in the middle, 200 to 1,000 1, acres, are all shrinking. The traditional family farms <clears throat> are going away, which means that farming, while continue to be a big part of our income here, is not going to really employ that many people. This has been true for a number of years. This is one of the problems that uh, a lot of old industrial towns are having trouble coming to terms with. We still make things. We manufacture more things here in the Midwest than we ever have. And we export more manufactured goods. We just do it with a lot fewer people. From my office in Chicago, I can look south across Lake Michigan to what's left of the integrated American steel industry there in northwest Indiana. They make more steel there than they ever did. The thing is, they do it with about one-tenth the number of workers. And if you're ever down in northwestern Indiana and go through Gary and places like that, you'll see the devastation that's been left behind. We're still going to have agriculture and we're still going to have to have manufacturing, but it's not going to support our <coughs> communities, our economies, our civilization the way it did before, and we have to figure out new ways of doing that. The next question is, regionalism is a real concept to many in this room. Please distinguish between competition, independence, and cooperation in terms of the region's place in the world. I think the thing is, you probably do almost all at the same time. No, I wouldn't say that. Independence, to be absolutely independent from what's going on in the rest of the world, to say that the rest of the world doesn't affect me. I don't know how much that there is here. I grew up with a lot of that. And that probably wasn't true back then, but it's no longer true. We will still compete. Um, we will, companies will compete with each other. People will compete with each other. Towns will compete with each other. Uh, there's still a lot of competition. But basically, the economic competition these days is not with Minnesota or Illinois or Michigan. The real competition is 10,000 miles away. <clears throat> and to be carrying on petty competition among ourselves here in the Midwest is, um, is self-defeating. What I mean by that is um, things like these bio-organizations. There's an I-bio-organization in, in Illinois. There's another one in Iowa, another in Wisconsin. Um, each state has its own bio-plan. Most of these plans are drawn up by a consulting operation in Columbus called Mattel, and I've read some of them. And I am convinced that when Iowa phoned Columbus and asked for a bio plan, that they just reached into the desk drawer, pulled out the plan from Missouri, told their computer that wherever it said Missouri to insert Iowa instead, then shipped it off to Des Moines. And read this about the same. A lot of this competition is about that line. We have here in the Midwest, not like the Big Ten universities, but other independent universities, wonderful Catholic universities. We have um, research organizations like Mayo, Argonne, Cleveland Clinic, places like that. We have here in the Midwest put together 
probably the greatest single concentration of intellectual firepower anywhere in the universe, including the Ivy League, except the trouble is we never put it together. We have all these schools, Wisconsin, Illinois, and Indiana, and Michigan, and Iowa, still compete with each other for faculty and research and grants and staff and students as fiercely as their teams compete on a Saturday. And in this day and age, it doesn't, this doesn't make any sense. An example, each of these schools has a graduate law school and a business school and a dentistry school and a journalism school and a, a school of medicine and an engineering school and all these other schools because that's what big universities do. And some of these schools are really good and some of them aren't so good. And I don't see where it's written that each Big Ten school has to have one of these uh, graduate schools all by itself. What about taking some of these best schools and merging, in, merging them into three or four real centers of academic excellence that would draw scholars and research and money and contracts from all around the world. These would be true global uh, uh, universities. Now somehow, I don't think this is something that's probably going to happen by the start of fall quarter. <laughs> but this is the way we ought to be thinking. As I said, this golden era is new. We have to be thinking about new ways to cooperate. We can still compete, but cooperation, not to leverage our strengths, is to uh, put us behind the eight ball before we get started. With regional government, there would be no local control, and one man would not have a voice. I like this idea. I said states should get out of the way in the book and county courthouses should become museums. Any county employees here? <laughs> <laughs> um, and this one is just really yes. The, most of it doesn't really make a lot of sense. The state lines here, the history of the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, 220 years ago or more, decreed where the state lines in the Midwest were going to be before there even were states. And they decreed that there would be counties, and they decreed that there would be townships. This was Jefferson democracy, as was seen then. The counties each were laid out with a certain size. I've never really been able to nail this down, but I'm told that each county was laid out back in the days of really bad roads. So an unmarried couple could get from the farthest reach of the county to the county seat and get a marriage license and get home before sundown. And the size of them indicates that there is probably something to this. In this day and age, this doesn't make any sense. Most Midwestern states have an enormous number of individual governmental units, individual jurisdiction, individual taxing bodies, many of them with their own ability to promote or stop development to get in the way to keep us from doing uh, what we should be doing. And to the degree that we can either go around them or to get to uh, overcome this, to that degree we will have economic vitality. Now, you raise another problem in this good one. How much local say do we lose in this? And I think it's inevitable that we lose some. In Europe, where I've spent a lot of time looking at the European Union, they have really achieved a lot of cooperation across provincial and across regional and across even national lines, getting a lot of their uh, <coughs> economic functions together. Now, this is still done by individual, by elected governments. Most of the decisions are made in Brussels, but they are made by ministers, representatives from elected national governments who go there to pass the laws. But this has given increased power to these the top levels of government, the cabinets. It's taken power away from the parliaments back home. In other words, it's taken away the power from the people who are most likely to know the voters directly. This has an impact. The Europeans do talk about what they call a democratic deficit. And in coping with the new demands of globalization, in coping with the um, way globalization's tendency to focus, to concentrate power in places, this is one of the upshots. How do we preserve 
our individual democratic voice? How do we preserve our own voice when economic decisions are, are being made? Without adhering so obsessively to past governmental structures that we destroy the very economy in which we have to live. Uh, there's an awful lot about globalization that we do, and it's undecided, and that's one of them. Another topic that you mentioned in your talk was illegal immigrants. They are willing to work cheaper, but the time will come when they too will want a better standard of living. But then, Then they will send their kids to school and start their own businesses and buy homes and settle down and try to achieve that better standard of living. I can say this with a great deal of certainty because that's already happening. In towns where immigrants have been for 20 or 30 years, it's precisely what's happening. It's certainly what's happening in Chicago. Um, the main shopping street in Chicago, the biggest money spender there, you won't be surprised to hear, is still Michigan Avenue. Second biggest money spending street in Chicago is 22nd Street, which runs right down the middle of the Mexican community. These are people who do own their own homes or own a lot of businesses who are highly entrepreneurial. Um, they are, a lot of their kids are dropouts, a lot of their other kids are staying in school, getting uh, degrees. Um, it's a process somewhat like we had with earlier immigration, immigrants. Um, you know, if you want to read some of the histories of earlier immigration, like the jungle lab in Sinclair, about the uh, stockyards in Chicago, mostly Lithuanian and Polish immigrants living in terrible conditions, incredible poverty. And now the people, of course, who are running, running the city. Um, I think this is the process that's going to continue if we enable to continue, as always. The immigrants are here doing us a favor because they say that they want to be here, they want to be part of our economy, part of our culture. And we are bringing them here because we need them desperately. All the Midwest is losing population. All the Midwest needs workers. Midwest is losing its best young people. Midwestern birth rate is not keeping up. If we're going to have a population here, we need immigrants. We need those PhDs from Asia. We need those workers from Mexico and Guatemala. And to have laws that say that the very people that we most need can't come here legally, can't work here legally, is, um, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. These are broken laws. They've often been compared to, say, the Prohibition Amendment, where there was more to it on all sides of the issue for people to break the law than to obey it. That is basically what we have here now with the immigration laws. And it, as has been pointed out many times, and I agree, one of the things this does is simply create a huge disrespect for the law. It's a broken law. We can round up all the illegal immigrants and send them back to Mexico, which isn't going to happen. Or we can change the law, which we're going to have to do. I do not underestimate the uh, <coughs> political problems in doing this. But for the Midwest's future, as with the Midwest's future over the past two centuries, it's immigrants who are going to build. It's just a different bunch of immigrants now. What about the demise of ethical capitalism? Uh, I just read them. I don't write them. <laughs> what about the demise of ethical capitalism? Ooh, there's a whole different subject. <laughs> um, that, and that's, uh, that's obviously a national problem. What we're seeing now, I think, so much of the, uh, the problems involved in this current economic crisis stem from a lot of rule breaking, a loss of, of, loss of ethics, a loss of community feeling. That is, that we're all part of this great community, that there are actually people out there that suffer from the decisions we take. How do we get this back? This is going to be the job of the next few years, of restoring capitalism in this country. Capitalism, um, listen to the radio, talk to the workers around the Midwest. Capitalism has got a terrific bad eye, probably the biggest black eye has had since 1929. And again, it's in the 30s when um, capitalism had to be built, had to be rescued from itself in a sense. 
I think that's probably what, what is going to happen now. Um, that is with globalization. Um, it's not a matter of throwing it out. It's not a matter of saying that. No more capitalism. No more globalization. Instead, how do we make this work? The only real criteria of the economy, the only way we can judge the economy, is the well-being of the people who live within it. I think we've lost that focus here now. This is the other question, I think, about globalization. Globalization has a moral component, and I think it really does. It is raising hundreds of millions, billions of people around the world in the third world to the kind of level of economic decency that we have always known here in this country and in the rest of the first world. But the big question is how do we do that without doing it on the backs of American workers? And we have not figured out the answer to that one. A point of uh, the Great Lakes being a resource for our future. Can we use the Great Lakes Compact as a blueprint for Midwestern states to present a unified approach to regional economic growth and diversity? Um, yes, it's a start. Is everybody here familiar with the Great Lakes Compact? Okay. Oh. okay. Um, the Great Lakes Compact protects the Great Lakes. It controls the diversion of the lakes. Uh, they're not going to, in the dark of night, take a great big pipeline from Nevada and take our water and use it to water golf courses outside Las Vegas. We've got to solve that problem. Okay, now we've got the water. What do we do with it? And that, that is going to be trickier. Uh, getting the compact together took years and years and years. There's a really good book by a guy named Peter Hammond called Great Lakes Water Wars. I recommend it to you. Just, just how much trouble it was getting this done. But it has been done. So now what? How do we use this water? What sort of industries are going to need the water? Not only industries that need water in their ordinary function, bottling and brewing, chemical industries, things like that. But how do we use this? all this water to create new industries, to find out ways of exploiting this water. Um, I don't think you can do this on a state-by-state -state basis. Uh, most states, most Great Lakes states border the Great Lakes, but most of the area of those states are actually on the lake. Chicago is on Lake Michigan. Most of Illinois, which doesn't care a whole lot about Chicago, is well, well away from it. The University of uh, Wisconsin in Milwaukee is talking about setting up a freshwater research institute, sort of a freshwater version of Scripps Oceanic Institute, which I think is a terrific idea to deal with these issues. I would love to see them do it also with the University of Illinois in Chicago and the Wayne State in Detroit and Case Western and Cleveland with other lakeside um, universities to get <coughs> uh, cooperation going on around the lakes themselves, if not between the states, between the universities or the cities or the economic regions supporting the lakes. I think we need a lot done there. The same people describe the prescription of digging is more globally competitive, particularly in agriculture. Is there a place for entrepreneurship, rich markets, and local networks of sustainable businesses? Absolutely. Um, and I think as I mentioned before, there is the, these smaller farms, these entrepreneurial farms, these farming, they're growing in number. And there's more and more of this. And, you know, I, th I think this is terrific and I think they do a wonderful job. I just don't want us to mistake this as the wave of the future. I find a lot of people feel that this sort of niche farming is fine, that this is what the um, future is going to be. And I'm afraid it's not. All the trends are toward ever larger farms, ever more concentration. This is driven by the big corporations. It sounds like I'm putting the blame on the corporations. Let's face it, it's the corporations in an earlier era, the railroads and the stockyards or whatever, that created and drove um, Midwestern agriculture. We made it what it is. We've all, this is Midwestern agriculture has always been a deal between the farmers and the big corporations, where the farmers generally fighting for everything they can get, and that, that is still the case. 
Um, I think that <coughs> small farmer is going to serve a certain market, and the market is going to be willing to pay for this. But the idea that these small farms can take on the burden and the challenge that faces American agriculture these days, which is to feed and feed better billions of people around the world to deliver farm produce in the quantity that is going to be demanded by hungry people around the world. I don't think they can do this. this it, it is a job for big agriculture, and those of us who carry around, as I do, considerable nostalgia for the old, typical family farm of the that we have time for one more question, and so I'm going to combine two of them. They spoke extensively about cities, counties, and regions banding together, becoming whole of our parts. They suggest some vehicles or concepts that will get us started. What can we do across state lines? Which I guess uh, translates or sums up uh, where do we start and how do we start? We have to start by trying to figure out what, what, what is your region? What is your natural region? What's the area that you have in common with other places? There, there are regions that you don't have much in common with. This is something you'd have to sit down and figure out yourself. Um, in my book, I talk a lot about the Midwest as one big region. I think the Midwest has some common, many common problems, but it does have to deal <coughs> as a region. But there are regions and there are regions. And I really think that the most effective region is probably going to be the smallest unit that works, that is effective economically and politically and socially. I talked about those universities around the Great Lakes form their own intellectual region to do something about water. Um, I talked about the uh, Chicago economic region, four state area, working together on joint marketing, on joint transport. Um, there's the towns along the Mississippi River. I think a lot of them uh, share a common problem, common past, common future, should be working together. Um, southwestern Wisconsin, so, uh, northwestern Illinois, northeastern Iowa, southeastern Minnesota, some of the most beautiful parts of the entire Midwest, but they all market themselves separately. They ought to be getting together for tourism marketing. Um, towns along um, the um, Lake Michigan, in Wisconsin. Should be looking across the lake to towns like, say, like Holland in, um, in Michigan, on the other side of the lake. I bet there's a common region there. There are regions and regions, so the idea is to figure out who, do you, what do you have in common with something geographic, economic, social, historical? Where do you hang together with other regions? I, you know, this definition, I'm willing to bet, does not stop at the town line or the county line. Does not necessarily have to encompass all of Wisconsin, and it really probably won't. But to sit down and figure out what your region is, and then move out and talk with people in those regions about what you can do together. This is not the same thing as saying, hey, let's merge with counties, which is not going to happen. Or, to, or saying that we have to have one big school in the middle or anything like that. It's just where can we cooperate? Where can we do things together to achieve? And the end that we both agree is the place we want to go. Thank you, Richard. And Richard will be staying around for the for the rest of the evening. So uh, please feel free to walk up, introduce yourself, and uh, talk about a topic if there's time.